right, we're going to have our presenters uh, come and sit down, and we're going to open it up to questions. And uh, Jan with the journal is going to, um, if you raise your hand, we can actually have bring the mic over and you can ask a question. But I'll, let me prime with one quick question to you guys. Is there a specific um, tool that EO has given you that you found invaluable, one that stands out in particular, or a set of tools that you'd want to talk about? Anybody can just chime in. Uh, the unique ability concept, I think, has probably had a huge impact on me. Do you want to explain that just really briefly? Uh, it's a book by Dan Sullivan that uh, explains that everyone in this room has a unique ability, a God-given unique ability, and it explains how to find out what that is. Great. Um, I, I keep saying that EO has been my street MBA. You know, as an engineer learning about business, it's been a, a great guide being surrounded by all these people. Uh, and then another uh, acronym for MBNA is uh, management by absence. So I started traveling more and more, and it's a great way to force me to work on the business and allow the awesome people that work for an awesome familia to do the work that they're really good at. I, I would say it's not. There's so many things I've learned, and I have my oper VP of operations here. She will say, thank God you're an EO, because before then I really wasn't a big fan of budgets and spreadsheets. and. <laughs> All those things that actually make us grow, um, we have to pay attention to. So um, I've learned enough to really help me figure out what's going to keep us on the track. Uh, for, for me, I think about it in two groups. There's the context of a business, and then there's the core. So I think the core is where you're providing value. It's the magic of what you do that's different and better. The context is, how do you do weekly meetings? How do you do reviews? What's strategic planning? You've got to have that. It's necessary. But if you burn too many cycles focusing on that context, you can't do what you're going to, where you're really creating value, which is the core of the business. So for me, EO provides that structure, that context, so I can focus on the core. Nice. Cameron? Uh, yeah, there's so many. I think um, the first one that comes to mind is something I learned from Jill. Uh, just the notion of a, a, you know, a business like any any community has shared values, and the more clearly you can articulate those and, and find people who match those, everything just gets so much easier. Uh, and I think for me that that's just like a complete game changer because, like you just said on Adam, there's there's so much technical learning how you run a meeting, blah blah blah. Um, but when when you're on the same page with someone from a value standpoint, it just gets a lot easier. Superb. Do you have any questions for the STEAM panel? Over there. Yes. Hey, Craig it is, I believe. <laughs> I always have questions. So uh, a lot of you are with, uh, or all of you are with fast-growing companies, and, we talk, and, and you guys focus on that. But I wonder if any of you have had the experience where uh, your growth stalls, where you hit a plateau and you, and, and, and you have a difficult time pushing past it and, and what you've done to sort of address that. Well, we think we gave Adam and Barry a chance. Do you guys want to chat? I would, I would just add that it's the same idea of looking at your business and what's going right. Because no one business has one. I mean, you could look at mine and say, oh, you just do speech therapy. But there's really so many components and different types of clients and where we do business and what we do. So identifying what's going well and try to do more of that. There's a lot of power in that when you get it right. Uh, I had a pretty pretty big stall. Um, I started with a, with a business partner, and the partnership wasn't going well. And it was uh, very different visions that we had. And we're, we're, we're friends now, so it was an amicable parting in 2010. Um, but we, we went through a period where, and again, stalled for us was 10 to 12% growth. Uh, but it's nothing compared to once we started learning how to run meetings, how to focus on core values. Um, we've tripled the business in the past in the past three years, and so um, uh, there's definitely. I, I think growth, you know, it, it's not a pretty linear curve. Growth is kind of like this. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we, we probably all have that experience. I think. Uh, I think for me, like, like growth is actually kind of a mirage. I, I think you know, people love stories and that snapshot. But ultimately, I, I think what matters is a lot of what Adam and Barry talked about, of finding what you're, you're actually passionate about and the, the work that you're going to love showing up to do every day. And the growth kind of takes care of itself. Um, so when my growth is stalled out, it's usually because, I, I, because I've been pursuing things that I'm not passionate about. If I could add one more thing, Craig, it would be, for me, it wasn't so much the products that we sell as a marketing firm, it's the people. So I replace them all, and I have a much better product. 
Um, but I don't advise everybody doing that. It's quite expensive. <laughs> so I think we have a question right over here. Um, so this one's actually for Cameron and Augusto. Um, for your businesses, what was the real benefits of becoming a B Corp, and would you recommend that to other companies that are starting out or actually established? I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm clearly not an unbiased party here. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think the benefit is, I guess like I said, I, I think about this a lot. Um, when people ask me sort of why I do things the way I do in business, and it's a lot of stuff I think I learned from people like uh, Barry and Adam, it's the, the whole core theme is being intentional. And so it's harder at first, but it's a lot easier later. And so I just think this basic premise, if you have a company where you said we're going to have a positive impact in the world, you inevitably, you attract better employees, your existing employees become more productive and they're more less likely to leave, they're more engaged. Um, so it's just, it's phenomenal. And, and it's harder at first, there's no question, right? It's hard enough just to, you know, it's hard enough just to make the spreadsheets line up and, and get your profits to a point where you can keep healthy growth and take care of everyone. Um, but I think that's that deeper sense of connection and purpose is, that's what it's all about. Um, I think like Barry said, we spend way too much time at work to not love what we do. Um, B Corp for, for Nossa Familia has, has been a great framework for to help us talk about the stuff that we do. Um, in the early days, I thought it was disingenuous for us to tell people that we were donating money. Uh, I don't think that way anymore. I'm, I'm actually, and internally, we have quite a, quite a modest team. Uh, and so I've had to tell people, no, we need to brag about this. Bragging about the stuff that we're doing is not bad. You know, we are, you know, being a force for good in the world. Uh, we've donated all this money. So, uh, but we were donating to, to charities locally. We were doing projects at the farm level. We were doing so many random different things. Uh, and we didn't have a way of talking about our impact. So becoming a B Corp has helped us uh, with a framework by which we talk about uh, our, our impact. Um, so we're about to, to look, we have a first draft of our first uh, sustainability and community impact report that's gonna be coming out in a little bit. And it, it's mind blowing because we do all this stuff and we forget about it. Even you know, internally we forget about the stuff that we've, we've been doing. Um, and you know, we're, we're a millennial company. Uh, the average age in, at Nasa Familia is, is 28. I'm, I'm one of the two or three non-millennials. I'm just over, over, over the red line, I guess. Um, You're totally not legit. But, but psychologically, you know, it's, I'm, psychologically, I think I'm a millennial. And we have an awesome team of millennials. If everybody, anybody else wants to talk offline about uh, millennials, and uh, we, we have an awesome team of millennials, and, and uh, it's a good thing. Any more questions, the brave? Right. Oh, right over here. Sold. Uh, so you guys talked about kind of why you do, why you do what you do. What things do you do to kind of you know rediscover or deepen or kind of remind yourself of why you do what you do? Oh, that's a good question. If I could jump in, uh, the more successful my business became, the further I got from what I'm passionate about, helping kids with special needs, and so. I really, we have a staff of 60 now, and we make a concerted effort to kind of loop back consistently, and I do, like I'll say, hey, let's go to coffee, or, and I, with frontline staff, and I said, I want to hear your horror stories, and I want to hear, you know, what made you smile today, and it's, it, it's not only wonderful to hear about what that experience is happening, but for that employee, it's a gift, and they're all excited to share it, so really staying in touch with what's happening on the front line. And I love doing it that way, and I, that's why I do almost no clinical work now. But at the same time, I'll step up and do that if it's needed. We had an opportunity to provide services in a juvenile lockup situation, and I was the one who got to pull the straw and do that. And it was a wild ride, and it, I heard stories and learned things, and. And also, I do want to speak to the value of giving to others. We take a team internationally every other year in order to, you know, do the right thing, because there's so many places in this world where kids with special needs have nothing, and they're not allowed to go to school. And so it's re reinvigorating to me to see what that does for my staff. I'll, 
take a stab at it, uh, real simple, Instagram. So we're a consumer product, people pick it up, they interact with it, they said, wow, I tasted this, this was an amazing taste, and then I started to get back into my painting or into my art and it inspired me to do this. Uh, so you, you get to see people interacting with your product and giving you real-time feedback on how uh, they're able to use it. And so for us, and we share that with the team, whether it's the manufacturing plant or our partners at Sakai, and that inspires us to, uh, to do more work and uh, uh, to see happy customers. That's kind of the name of the game. Uh, for us, we have a meeting that's called Greatest Hits, and uh, people share all the great things going up at our company every Wednesday morning. So I get to hear about 30 great things that the company's had an influence on and also with all the five-star reviews. So that just sort of having those feedback loop, I think, reinforces it over and over. Oh. Super. Oh, go ahead. Uh, one quick one. Uh, as we've gotten bigger, it's allowed us to travel more. So again, it, it helps us fulfill our, our purpose of nurturing positive relationships locally and globally. So I've taken uh, groups, six groups, to Brazil on coffee tours. And this was the second year that we've taken people to Guatemala. And so uh, maybe we're going to pivot in, in, in a few years from now. We're going to be 50% a travel agency. Because I, I get so fired up about taking people abroad. And, and this is not a posh five-star tour. This is a reality tour. We eat, uh, we go and we help the farmers harvest coffee. We eat at their dinner table. Um, it, it's, you, you get some deep uh, relationships. So the relationship is really big. Actually, for, we're, we're financing the first trip for Timoteo. First time he's going to leave Guatemala to come to the United States so, so he can attend the Specialty Coffee Association and so he can spend two days with us in Portland. So those connections, that's what gives me goosebumps. I think we have one more last question, then we'll wrap up. Uh, you all talk about uh, working 80 hours a week and things like that. And any recommendations on any kind of like work balance, work-life balance? Um, <laughs> any recommendations on scheduling or anything like that with small kids or raising a family or things like that? I definitely want to talk about that. <laughs> Because, you know, I started my business intentionally because I had a daughter that was going to go to school and I couldn't imagine not being the one to pick her up or drop her off, which made me have this probably now sleep disorder because I would <laughs> be at home and do the dinner homework thing and then go to work at nine and work till one or two and then you get up at six and really what every other woman I know does. So... Uh, I'm not special, I'm not trying to say that. M my point is, it's as business has grown, I've been very intentional to hire people, and I'm a big believer in delegating, and I know a lot of business owners don't wanna let go of stuff, because it is, it's your baby. But I also feel like I don't want my baby living in the basement at 30, and if I'm working 80 hours a week, you know, I'm gonna keep it chained right to me. So, uh, delegate, as soon as you can afford it and, and give yourself a break. I do not work 80 hours a week. I, I really don't. <laughs> I love not working. <laughs> I'm with Sharon. Um, I mean, to me, if, if, from my perspective, if, if I'm working you know, anything over probably 45 hours a week, I'm doing something really wrong. Um, one of the big turning points for me, I, I, I think, I mean, I'm always fascinated with this notion of a well-designed business, and that applies to all of us, a well-designed life. And I think work can be such a, a, a greedy master if you're not careful. And the more you work, the more you create work. So for me, one of the turning points came uh, after those downward-facing graphs that Barry showed in the recession. Um, I was doing some introspection, and someone challenged me to say, like, what's a, what's a vision you have for yourself that's really compelling that you're working towards? And I've always loved traveling the world. And I just said, I just blurted out, I want, I want to go abroad four times a year. And I, you know, I hadn't taken a vacation over probably a week in six years. And it was interesting from that point on, I was on the plane flight home, and I just said, I'm doing that now. Um, twice a year. Before I decided it wasn't as much as I did. But I started going every year. Since then, I've gone abroad twice a year for at least two weeks. I don't check email. Um, I've, I've told my team, you can, you, know, you can email me at my Gmail account. And it's interesting that... That's sort of, I view it as like taming, taming like the beast, right? Because I just think with work and even more so with cell phones, it's just nonstop if you don't intentionally say, this is how I want to design it. Um, and I think we slip into just doing a lot of activity rather than the things that, that really produce results. So I, I and, and we're very clear with this with our team too. I mean, there, there's periods where maybe you have to work 45 hours in a week, 
But anything more than that, the system's designed wrong. So I want to be respectful of your time. We were at 9.05. Thank you guys for staying a little extra. Let's give a hand to our panel. And, uh, and thank you, uh, Portland Business Journal, for hosting uh, this EO event. And if you're an entrepreneur that wants to learn and grow, you're welcome to join me downstairs in the card room in about five to 10 minutes. And we're going to do a test drive so you can learn more about what this EO thing is that has led to all this success. And otherwise, uh, thank you guys and have a great day. And thanks for coming. <laughs>